So uh, this series of slideshows is going to be on proximal femur injuries, uh, hip dislocations, femoral head fractures, femoral neck fractures, intertrochanteric fractures. Um, and uh, we'll start with the hip dislocations and femoral head fractures. Here you can see, uh, just on this x-ray alone, quite a few uh, injuries. You've got a hip dislocation right bilaterally. Okay, maybe there's an acetabulum fracture on the left as well. Maybe a subtrochanteric femur fracture on the right as well. Very unusual picture, uh, but obviously this is the stuff we're going to be talking about here. So a lot of uh, the concerns with hip dislocations uh, center around uh, the blood supply to the femoral head. Right, the devastating problem that can happen with hip dislocations is late. Uh, development of osteonecrosis, which can be very crippling uh, for a young 20-something-year-old patient to develop that, uh, where uh, we just do not have good uh, treatments and uh, uh, patients can end up requiring uh, arthroplasty. So uh, the blood supply of the femoral head in includes the artery of the ligamentum teres, which in children is important, but as we get older um, does not contribute uh, as much. And clearly with a hip dislocation. This is going to be completely disrupted. Probably more important in most adults are the ascending cervical branches. Uh, these arise uh, from a ring at the base of the neck and uh, they f are formed from the uh, uh, vessels you're probably aware of, the, the medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries. Uh, they penetrate the capsule near its femoral attachment and go up the neck um, and then they per perforate the bone just, you know, uh, at the neck distal to the articular cartilage. So this is what can get injured um, or kinked or um, uh, basically disrupted um, where uh, you get problems with hip dislocations leading to late osteonecrosis. <clears throat> so when you dislocate the femoral head uh, from the joint, the capsule uh, tears and then uh, the ascending cervical branches are torn or stretched. Clearly the lig artery of the ligamentum teres is going to be gone, right? But it's maybe not that important uh, in the adult. Um, so if the hip is dislocated, if you remember that first picture, uh, and I think that picture comes back in the next slide, with a native hip dislocation that femoral head is completely out of position and those ascending cervical branches can become kinked or compressed and that's why you need to get these reduced right away because if you get a dislocated hip reduced right away if there is a vessel if there are vessels that are present but just kinked and compressed you get it reduced you can potentially help to restore blood flow to the femoral head All right so you imagine uh, you know here's your uh, femoral head uh, dislocated way, way out of the socket. It needs to be all the way up here. And uh, those uh, vessels that normally, you know, may be sitting, you know, maybe up here and here are now being pulled all the way down here, right? I mean, this thing is like, you know, being stretched down to here. So um, this is why you want to get this uh, reduced right away in a native hip dislocation. Um, mechanism is often knee versus dashboard, so you can get some associated injuries in the lower extremities with hip dislocations. Um, as you may imagine, sciatic nerve injuries, you know, they, they, that nerve gets stretched as well when a hip dislocates, uh, and um, you have to look for this. Uh, you know, when a patient comes into uh, the emergency room and trauma, uh, sometimes if they have a hip dislocation, there's been major multiple trauma. And like any neurologic evaluation, make sure you get a good evaluation early on uh, before the patient maybe gets intubated or gets a lot of medications on board or you know ends up on the operating room table and then you can't check if they had a nerve uh, palsy or not. So if you ever have to go under anesthesia to, hip, to reduce a hip dislocation, it would be nice to know what the neurologic exam was ahead of time. Now, um, most commonly these were, the uh, uh, sciatic nerve injury uh, can resolve with the reduction of the hip and passage of time, but not always. You can't get a permanent uh, foot drop from these. Uh, 
uh, and typically the uh, perineal distribution is affected more uh, than the um, tibial distribution so um, but you could get both so before you reduce sometimes you might need to get additional x-rays. I mean, when you have a hip dislocation, it's an emergency. You need to get it reduced. So you don't want to go overboard with lots of and lots and lots of imaging. Um, but occasionally, um, if you don't see the femoral neck well enough and you're not sure if there's also a femoral neck fracture, um, getting a, a, another radiograph or if the patient's going through the CT scanner uh, can help to, to rule that out. Um, and um, if a patient's getting at CT scan, which is so commonly done nowadays in certainly North American trauma centers, uh, you know, making sure that they uh, get some cuts through the acetabulum might be helpful, again, to rule out a non-displaced femoral neck fracture. CT scan can show other things as well, uh, such as uh, fractures that you can't see on x-ray. Here's an example of uh, you have an acetabulum fracture on, on the left uh, involving the anterior wall. Uh, there's a posterior wall fragment that's actually flipped into the joint. So um, I think based on my evaluation of that CT image, that hip is not going to concentrically reduce. Now, it's important to point out um, that that femoral head here, okay, it's kind of sort of in the acetabulum. It's, perf it's absolutely not congruent, but it's also not grossly, grossly dislocated like on that previous image. Um, with the hip completely out, not, not the same patient, but um, so the question I often get asked is, is this something that needs to emergently go to the OR because it's not reduced, right? It's not reduced like this one, okay? And um, my answer would be probably not. You'd have to sort of uh, see the other images and the, the radiographs or maybe a coronal CT scan. If the hip is pretty much back in the socket for the most part, but not perfectly congruent, then you've probably addressed the issue of the stretching of the vessels for the most part. I mean, it's certainly off by a few millimeters or, or a centimeter, but it's not completely grossly out to the point that the vessels are stretched or kinked, right? So you've probably done your job to prevent AVN, I would uh, argue, in a case like this. But um, you've got an acetabulum fracture with a fragment flipped into joint. So this patient probably should be in a little bit of skeletal traction to offload the head scraping up against this fragment. And if you know, you're a surgeon who's skilled, experienced, and comfortable managing uh, an acetabulum fracture, if you need to open this, um, then by all means you can consider taking that patient to the OR and getting it all right at once. But um, certainly the on-call surgeon may not be comfortable doing that and um, may not, in my opinion, have to do that, okay? So emergent treatment of dislocated tips, it's, yeah, it's something I think I've covered already. The goal is to reduce the risk of AVN and osteonecro I'm sorry, osteonecrosis and degenerative joint disease down the road. Uh, this helps to restore blood flow uh, through those uh, occluded vessels, the cervical ascending branches. Um, we don't have super literature about this, but the literature that is available supports decreased rates of osteonecrosis with early reduction. Uh, of course, you need to have good anesthesia either in the emergency department or in the operating room, and oftentimes you need one patient stabilizing, I'm sorry, one physician or person stabilizing the pelvis while somebody else is reducing the hip. If you truly have an irreducible hip, um, like it's dislocated and absolutely just doesn't go back in, then you need to go up to, to the OR and general anesthesia and, if necessary, open reduction uh, to uh, prevent the risk of osteonecrosis. Um, since you're going to the OR, if there's not going to be any delay, a CT scan could be helpful uh, to make sure you don't have any surprises when you get in there, like non-displaced fractures. Um, and uh, typically the surgical approach is from the side of the dislocation. So posterior hip dislocation, you typically go posteriorly. Uh, you just have to be very careful that the sciatic nerve uh, and other structures are, are not going to be uh, in their normal anatomic position. So you have to proceed very cautiously.
If the hip is stable after reduction and the reduction is congruent, um, treatment is non-operative. Uh, there are some uh, precautions to prevent re-dislocation, but oftentimes toe touch weight bearing is uh, fine and uh, you uh, allow uh, the patient to get up. Um, these are some of the operative indications, so irreducible hip dislocations, femoral neck fractures, incarcerated fragments in the joint, uh, incongruent reduction, uh, and unstable hip after reduction. So, you know, irreducible hip dislocation would be an emergency. Hip dislocation with a displaced femoral neck fracture in a young patient may also be, you know, uh, an emergency. Um, whereas the, the three, four, and five are uh, are indications for surgery, although uh, not necessarily uh, emergent. Incarcerated fragments, as we saw, are picked up on CT scan, and depending on the size, are something that might need to be opened, maybe need to be scoped, uh, but uh, this, a clinical decision has to be made as to whether or not uh, uh, it, surgery is necessary. Uh, but certainly uh, visible fragments, especially if they're causing uh, any incongruent reduction, probably need to be dealt with. An incongruent reduction is typically from acetabulum fractures, could be from an interposed um, bone fragment, um, possibly soft tissue, uh, and certainly a femoral head fracture can cause this as well, and uh, the hip does not tolerate an incongruent reduction, so it will go on to post-traumatic arthritis, and therefore addressing this is you know, a surgical matter. Um, unstable hips after reduction usually are due to some kind of big posterior wall fracture, okay? Uh, that's the most common thing. Um, perhaps labral detachments or tear can cause this, but uh, I don't think you're going to see that quite as often. Actually, that said, if the patient has some type of acetabular dysplasia uh, or shallow acetabulum, uh, that could potentially also be a cause that's not mentioned here of instability. Uh, osteonecrosis is a devastating complication and uh, Again, I keep coming back to this. This is the reason why you want to get them reduced uh, right away, uh, is to try and prevent that. So I'll say a few more words about uh, femoral head fractures before we finish this uh, slideshow out. So these occur usually as a shearing type of an injury. When the femoral head dislocates, right, the femoral head shears off. With less hip flexion, the fracture tends to be larger. So here's an example of an infrafoveal uh, femoral head fracture, so you can imagine, you know, if the uh, uh, acetabulum, uh, you know, was something like this, and uh, the femoral head, um, you know, dislocates, right, right, so dislocates and shears, instead of shearing off the posterior wall, it shears off uh, a portion of the femoral head. Okay, and then that's your femoral head fracture. So it could also happen with re-reduction, but typically happens, you know, with a dislocation. Okay. Pipkin two is uh, a fracture that ex extends above the fovea. Okay, if I remember the fovea is here. Here's a ligamentum teres. So infrafoveal. Now we have uh, above the fovea. This is typically a much bigger fragment. And Pipkin three is a femoral head fracture with a femoral neck fracture uncommon, can happen, and then uh, Pipkin 4 is a femoral head fracture with an acetabulum fracture, and you'll see some of these occasionally, uh, typically some type of posterior wall fracture, but also there's some femoral head injury, and uh, this is obviously not a good combination of uh, problems to have because uh, even if you fix the acetabulum and get it anatomic, I mean the femoral head fracture can still cause problems with incongruence down the road. Uh, you often will pick these up on plain radiographs, but post-reduction CT scans help to show uh, the congruence as well. Um, so I highly encourage you get post-reduction CT scans on your uh, hip dislocations um, to check for fragments, to check to make sure that there's no femoral head fracture that you didn't see. Um, if it's a type 1 and it's anatomically reduced, and you'll see these sometimes, you can consider non-operative management. Uh, but if it's displaced, um, these typically should be fixed. Uh, uh, anterior approach usually gets you um, right onto the fragment, um, but 
uh, posterior approach, you know, with surgical dislocation can can get you there as well. Um, Superfovial fractures, much bigger fragment. These can be fixed uh, usually through either an anterior or posterior approach. But still, I, I, and certainly in my hands, I think the anterior approach allows you to fix these um, even without surgical dislocation. Uh, and of course, with surgical dislocation, you can get a nice uh, visualization. Pipkin three fractures uh, require you to uh, treat the uh, femoral head and uh, that should say femoral neck. Um, they have a high incidence of uh, post-traumatic arthritis, um, and uh, the uh, Pipkin four fractures, which are the acetabulum, actually, I'm sorry for the error here, uh, and the uh, um, and the femoral head, um, obviously, are a problem as well. Um, you know, I, like I said, these oftentimes, even if you fix the acetabulum, you may need to uh, uh, consider a um, treatment of the femoral head and sometimes if there's severe impaction of the femoral head uh, those patients can still end up with uh, arthroplasty. Alright so I'm going to end there and uh, sorry for a little mix-up with the types 3's and 4's um, but uh, that's pretty much what you need to know about uh, Pipkin fractures, hip dislocations. Thank you.